They once asked Carl Sagan, why are you so interested in the stars if we live here on Earth? And he answered without raising his voice, because we are part of them. Every calcium atom in your bones, every particle of iron in your blood was forged in the heart of a star that died long before you were born. When you understand that, there is no outside and inside. We are the universe trying to understand itself. Carl Sagan was not just an astronomer. He was one of those rare minds who, when speaking of science, made you want to be a better human being. He had the gift of uniting the distant with the intimate, of making millions of people look at the sky and feel they were also looking within themselves. He was born in 1934 in Brooklyn, into a modest family. His mother, Rachel, was an intelligent homemaker who never had the chance to go to college. His father, Sam, was a Russian immigrant who worked as a garment cutter. Neither of them were scientists, but both nurtured in him a mixture of curiosity, imagination, and ethics. When he was just five, his mother took him to the New York World's Fair. It was the first time he saw a planetarium. He walked out convinced of one thing. He wanted to know everything about that sky. Yeah. What are those lights? Why are they there? How do we know we're not alone? That curious child never left. He just learned to use better words. In high school, he read Edgar Allan Poe at night and great astronomers in the afternoon. He was fascinated by mystery as much as by method. And it was that combination, reason plus wonder, that stayed with him forever. A science teacher asked him when he was 15, and what do you want to do with your life, Carl? He looked at her and said, I want to find life beyond earth. And if I don't find it, I want to teach others how to look for it. He fulfilled both. He studied at the University of Chicago, where he learned physics, biology, philosophy, and writing. There, he developed an obsession with the great questions, the origin of life, time, consciousness. But understanding them wasn't enough. He wanted to communicate them. And he did so with a gentle voice, an honest smile, and an astonishing ability to explain everything without making it small. He didn't speak to scientists. He spoke to everyone even to those who had never looked through a telescope. Science is not just a body of knowledge, he said. It is a way of thinking and an act of humility because it reminds us of how little we know and how much we still have to learn. His story is powerful, not because he published scientific papers, even though he did, nor because he collaborated with NASA. It's powerful because he reminded us, like few others, that knowledge is not the opposite of feeling and that understanding the universe, even a little, can be one of the purest forms of love. During his years at the University of Chicago, Carl Sagan didn't just become a scientist, he became a storyteller. He had an unusual ability to listen to complex theories, filter them rigorously, and return them with beauty he wasn't a communicator who became a scientist. He was a scientist who could not stop communicating. One of his professors, after hearing him speak in class, told him, you're not just going to do science. You're going to make others love it. He was right. After earning his doctorate, Sagan worked with NASA during crucial moments of space exploration. He helped design the biological experiments for the Viking mission to Mars and contributed to the preparation of the Pioneer and Voyager missions. But his most unforgettable mark was human, not technical. When the Voyager probes were being prepared, Sagan proposed including a message in case some extraterrestrial intelligence ever found them. He designed a golden record with greetings in 55 languages, sounds from Earth, music by Bach and Chuck Berry, and the recording of a human heartbeat. A TV interviewer once asked him, do you really think someone will listen to it? With his usual half smile, he replied, probably not, but it says something beautiful about us that we want to send it. 
That was his way of thinking. To do science not just to get answers, but to say who we are. In 1980, he launched Cosmos, a personal journey, the documentary series that would change the history of science communication. Millions around the world watched him walk among simulated galaxies, speak passionately about DNA, or whisper by the ocean. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies, were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. Cosmos didn't teach science like a manual. It taught science like an epic adventure. Carl Sagan didn't recite facts. He invited you to feel, to understand, that knowledge is not a privilege, but a right. Not everyone agreed. Some academics thought he was too accessible. He was denied entry into the National Academy of Sciences, but he never grew bitter. When a journalist asked him if it hurt, not being accepted by his peers, he answered, it hurts more that today's children don't have teachers who talk about Mars as if it were a love story. His vocation was bigger than any recognition. He published more than 600 scientific papers and 20 books, but he never stopped visiting schools, answering letters from teenagers, or participating in public debates about science and politics. Sagan understood that knowledge without empathy is dangerous, that science must have a face, a voice, and a purpose. Teaching, he believed, was not a technical act, but a deeply moral one. If we don't teach people to think critically, others will do the thinking for them, and not always with good intentions. That is why he spoke. That is why he wrote. That is why he lit the spark of wonder in millions, even if they didn't know everything. Because he knew that the first step toward any wisdom is always curiosity. Once in a televised debate, a journalist asked him why he insisted so much on saying that we are small. He replied, because we are. But that's not sad. It's beautiful. It's what makes us valuable. We are tiny, and yet we can understand the universe. Carl Sagan dedicated his life to defending a powerful idea that science is not a cold instrument but a tool to uplift us. That by looking outward toward the cosmos, we were also looking inward toward ourselves. One of his most famous concepts is the pale blue dot. When Voyager 1 was more than 6 billion kilometers from Earth, he insisted on turning it around one last time to take a picture of our planet. The result was a small, barely visible dot suspended in a beam of light what he said after seeing that image became immortal. Look again at that dot. That's our home. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives on a moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. Sagan understood that this perspective wasn't depressing. On the contrary, it was clarity, consciousness, a reminder that there is no them and us in space. There is only us, fragile humans responsible for one another. He defended critical thinking. He didn't fear pseudoscience because it was ridiculous, but because it was dangerous. Because when we stop questioning rigorously, we stop being free. We live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology, he once said. And yet hardly anyone knows anything to you about science and technology. That is a prescription for disaster. His ideas went beyond the cosmic. He spoke about politics, ethics, education, the environment. He was among the first to warn about global warming, to speak of nuclear winter, to demand disarmament, using both scientific and human arguments. Carl Sagan didn't use science to be right. He used it to invite reflection, to make the powerful think twice, and to remind us that compassion and logic do not have to be separated. When a student asked him at a conference, what do you think is the most urgent thing we should teach today? 
Sagan didn't hesitate. To distinguish between what we want to be true and what is true, that is the first step toward wisdom. And perhaps that was his greatest lesson. Knowledge without humility is arrogance, and science without love is just calculation. Carl Sagan changed how millions think about the universe, but what he truly transformed was how they feel about it, not as spectators, but as part of the greatest story ever told. He spoke softly. He had that serene way of explaining even the most complex things, as if it were natural to understand the expansion of the universe or the life cycle of a star. But behind that voice, there was also exhaustion and sometimes pain. He wasn't a flawless hero. He had days of doubt, moments of fatigue. He slept little and suffered when he felt ignorance gaining ground over critical thought. But he was also a deeply loving man. He married three times, and it was in his third marriage to the writer and producer, Anne Druyan, that he found his great companion. Together, they not only shared love, but also work. They wrote scripts, designed the Voyager Golden Record, and debated philosophy and science as if discussing music. In an intimate interview, Anne said that when they first began talking, Carl told her, I can't promise you eternity, but I can promise you a life full of beautiful questions. And that is what he gave her. Carl was also a father of five. His relationship with some of them, especially his eldest son, Nick, was complex, but he always tried to teach them not what to think, but how to think. At home, skepticism was a value, curiosity a virtue. Beyond television and books, he loved the ordinary, cooking, listening to jazz, telling Greek myths, reading poetry and laughing a lot. He had a discreet but sharp sense of humor. When asked if he believed in God, he often smiled and said, that depends on which God you mean. The universe has things far more impressive than an old man with a beard on a cloud. In 1994, he was diagnosed with a rare bone marrow disease, myelodysplasia, honey tea. It was serious. The treatment was long and uncertain. Sagan did not hide it, but he didn't surrender to dramatics either. He wrote from the clinic, gave lectures whenever he could, and recorded one last interview with Charlie Rose just a year before his death. In that interview, he was asked, are you afraid of death, Carl? He paused, then said, I would prefer to live longer. There is so much to learn, but I'm not terrified. I've had the privilege of living, of loving, of understanding a little bit of the universe. That is more than many can dream. In his last book, the Demon Haunted World. He wrote words that today sound like a farewell. I want to know. I want to understand, even when the truth is not what I want to hear. Carl Sagan died on December 20th, 1996. He was 62, too soon for someone who spoke with the voice of time. There were no grand official tributes, but in thousands of homes, in classrooms, in planetariums, in the underlined pages of Cosmos, his voice endures, not as an echo, but as a guide. Because beyond what he explained, what he left us was a way of looking, with wonder, with tenderness, with reason, and with love. Carl Sagan didn't build a revolutionary theory like Einstein, nor did he found a philosophical school like Socrates, nor design a machine like Turing. What he did was more invisible, but equally powerful. He planted a way of thinking. He died in 1996, yet he remains alive in documentaries that imitate his voice, in the pale blue dot memes circulating online, in the young people who open a science book with a mix of vertigo and hope, in every person who looks at the sky and feels a sting of humility. He wasn't a science communicator, he was a builder of bridges between knowledge and emotion, between method and wonder, between the immense and the intimate. 
His legacy isn't measured in discoveries, but in what he awakened in millions of minds. Curiosity, awareness, respect. Once during a talk with students, a young boy stood up and asked him, do you think humanity has a future? Sagan looked at him with a mix of tenderness and gravity and replied, it will, if we decide to deserve it, if we learn to care for reason, as we care for water, if we teach our children to think, not just to obey, if we remember that we all come from the same place, from the stars, that is the core of his legacy. An ethics of knowledge, not as a weapon, but as an antidote. In the demon-haunted world, his most personal and political book, he warned with clarity, we are sliding silently into a time of superstition, ignorance, and manipulation. We need science, but not cold science, science accompanied by human values. Today his warnings sound more relevant than ever. Misinformation, contempt for knowledge, environmental urgency, disconnection from the essential. And yet, his message remains light. Thinking is an act of love. Asking questions is a form of resistance. Understanding even a little is what makes us human. At his funeral, there were no fireworks, just a simple sentence from Anne Druyan, his wife and companion in everything. Carl is no longer here, but he taught me to see with his eyes. And when I look at the Milky Way, I still hear him say, look, isn't it beautiful? And it is beautiful, because even if we do not have all the answers, Sagan left us the right questions. He taught us that knowing is not storing data, but seeking meaning without abandoning rigor. That truth can be defended with tenderness. That science does not need to be separated from poetry. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. That's what he said. And it remains true. Because as long as someone looks at the sky and wonders why it shines, as long as a child opens a book and feels the universe calling, as long as a teacher doesn't teach answers but wonder. Carl Sagan will be alive, and his legacy will not be a statue, but a spark dash, dash a quiet spark, burning in the middle of the infinite. If this story has touched you, if you have ever looked at the sky and asked questions, give it a like and subscribe to keep discovering the wisdom of the minds who helped us understand the universe and ourselves.